Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, we come now in the name of Jesus, asking again for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want us to turn to the book of Habakkuk. If you haven't been reading in the Old Testament for a while, it's about the fifth book back from Matthew. I preached on this some time ago, but I'm, while I will probably review some, I trust that God will help us to get something new out of this. The book of Habakkuk, and I want to, first of all, tell you, and you probably know, this is one of the shortest books in the Bible. And very little, if anything, is known about this prophet. Not very much is said, just three short chapters. And yet one of the great, some of the, the great truths have come out of this little book. As a matter of fact, Paul in the book of Romans gives that wonderful verse, the just shall live by faith. Paul didn't tell you that, Habakkuk did. If you read there, it says that Paul says, as it is written, which means the Old Testament, and Paul is simply quoting Habakkuk. So the verse came from this little known prophet. And uh, Paul here got a hold of this, and, uh, and he then the, later, later on, you find in about the 15th century, wasn't it? Martin Luther finally from the Catholic Church got a hold of it, and he saw, look, the, the truth of this, the just shall live by faith, and started a revival, reformation, throughout Europe from this little verse, back from Habakkuk. It spread on over into England, and uh, somebody was reading to John Wesley, was in the audience, the preface to Romans, and just in the preface, he's talking about living by faith. We've got to have faith in God, and Wesley's heart was strangely warm, but the foundation goes back to this little known prophet. We don't know when he was born, when he died, we don't know much about him, but out of this came this great truth of the Word of God. So, as I said, very little is known about him. I was reading some and trying to check up a little on this a uh, book of Harry Ironsides, one of God's great preachers. Uh, he's dead now. He was pastor of the Moody Memorial Church in, in Chicago, a church that's seated I've mentioned before, about 5,000. And Ironside, in reading this, he was talking about one place here where Habakkuk is going to wait on God, and Ironside said, there is nothing harder for a man to do than to wait on God. Now, here's pastor of a big church in Chicago. He said, there isn't anything harder to do than that. He said, the restlessness and activity of the flesh will not brook delays, but count the time spent in waiting on God so much lost time. That's what he said. There's something else that he said, and I want to read here. Uh, he said, we, speaking about uh, Habakkuk, he said he was... He's giving, his, he's giving you the synopsis of this, that uh, really the book of Habakkuk is a personal testimony. It's the personal testimony of a confused man. He's confused and doesn't know what to do. So he's giving us in these three little chapters, this little known prophet comes out and is giving us, and he begins as a man confused, this what... Uh, uh, from uh, Ironside said, he begins as a man confused and bewildered who is filled with questions and perplexities, and uh, he closes as one who has found the answer to all his questions. Have you ever been confused and bewildered and don't know what to do and can't understand what God's doing and why he doesn't do this or why he does that and you're confused about it all? Well, that's the way Habakkuk was, but finally he wounds up and he finds the answer to all of his questions. He's giving his personal testimony, you see. He answered to all the questions and the satisfying position of his soul is in God himself. So the answer to all life's questions lies in God. Blessed is the person who can find the same answer that Habakkuk found. That man will be a happy man indeed. 
Well, I want us to start reading here in the end of this book, first of all, the answer he found, or part of it, in the third chapter of Habakkuk, uh, starting with the 16th verse. We find Habakkuk is writing here. He said, when I heard my belly trembled, my lips quivered. He's hearing what God is, what's going to happen, what is going to take place. He said, when I heard about it, he said, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he cometh up to his people, he will invade them with his troops. Now look at this. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail. And the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer of my, on my stringed instruments. Now, I want you to notice here that these days, he said, although the fig tree shall not blossom, I want you to know these days had not yet come. He wasn't living in those days. But God had let him get a little glimpse into the future, and what he saw was going to be terrible. But he had so prepared his heart with God, he had prepared his heart for the future, that he said, I, it doesn't make any difference what comes if the fig tree doesn't blossom and there's no fruit on the vine and there's no labor, uh, there's no olive, the olives shall fail and there's no, the field shall yield no meat and the fox and the fold will be cut off and there'll be no herds in the stall. He said, I want you to know that if that comes to pass, I want you to know I'm going to rejoice. Brother, what a victory. But he prepared his heart when he sought God. He prepared his heart for the future that he said, it doesn't make any difference to me what comes to pass. I want you to know that I'm going to rejoice. Because, he said, the Lord is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet. You know, the hinds that jump around on the mountains and rock their hind's feet, they, they exactly track the front one so they are steady and they, fall, they don't fall. And he said, God's going to be like that with me. Whatever comes, I'm not going to fall. What a wonderful, wonderful thing that he had found. So he was quoting this here. Uh, he was prepared for whatever was ahead so that it, whatever it came to pass, he was going to be prepared for it. And he said, I want you to know, I don't care how bad it gets, I'm going to rejoice. What a marvelous thing this dear man found. Now, notice he's giving his personal testimony. He said, if this is what happens, I want you to know I'm going to rejoice in it, and this will be the attitude of my heart. I tell you, it's wonderful to have a heart that's prepared for whatever lies ahead. It's wonderful to have a heart like that because you're trusting in God. Now, some people feel like if they're Christians that nothing bad will ever happen to them. I want you to know that most anything can happen, but still there's strength and power in God. God will sustain us. So Habakkuk said, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hinds feet, and uh, so that they won't stumble. But he's, I want you to notice what he's going to do. He's going, the reason he found the answer to this in the second chapter, he said, I'm going to rejoice by faith. Not by what I see, but I'm going to do it by faith. And God wants his people to be prepared for anything, but it's going to have to be because they are prepared in the realm of faith. They believe and trust in God. I was reading in the book of Acts, the 23rd chapter and the 11th verse, it's rather an interesting thing, where Paul uh, was, had been caught by uh, the, the soldiers, the people. He was in a place where they were about to tear him to pieces. The soldiers came and rescued him and brought him into the prison to protect him there, to keep him. And God spoke to Paul, and, Paul, and he said to Paul, Paul, be of good cheer. Acts 23, maybe I ought to turn it and read it. Acts 23, the third, third, 23rd chapter. And the 11th verse, I think it is. He said, and that night, the, the following, and the night following, the Lord stood by me and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for thou hast testified for me in Jerusalem. Thou must test witness in Rome. Now, the New International Version says, be of good cheer, I mean, be of good courage. 
But the King James Version says, be of good cheer. And Weiss, the was professor of Greek in the Moody Bible Institute. He taught Greek in the Moody Bible Institute. And uh, he has his own translation there. And he said the real meaning here is that both are, are true. He said, Paul, be uh, of cheerful courage. Uh, it's going to take courage, but I want you to be of good cheer. Uh, it, now, that's interesting to me. Paul is, now the things that are ahead for him. God, now God said, now look, Paul, the things that are ahead for you, I want you to be cheerful and courageous, but you be cheerful in all you're going to go through. I want you to be cheerful about it. He's going to be, he's going to be shipwrecked. Now, Paul, you be cheerful. He's going to be in chains. Now, Paul, you be cheerful. Uh, so he's going to be shipwrecked and in chains and in prison. Now, Paul, when you get in prison, you be cheerful. Come on, man. <laughs> he didn't say, Paul, grit your teeth and bear it. He didn't say, Paul, now grit your teeth and hang on, hang on. He said, be cheerful about it. Yeah, glory. I'm glad to get that glory in there. Isn't that something? Dear me, if he'd have just said, hang on, I can understand that. But to say to be cheerful and being sick, you read that story of his shipwreck, of the days out there being tossed on the deep, it looked like all life was gone, all hope was gone, and he's in chains and going to be cast into prison. And God said to him, now you be cheerful about what's to come on you. He's talking about the future, things you don't know. If we could prepare our hearts so that we could be cheerfully courage in every situation in the future, this is what God wants out of his children. God said, be of cheerful courage. I like that. In other words, <laughs> Paul, I want you happy over what you're going to go through. I don't want you just gritting your teeth and bearing and say, I'm hanging on. God have mercy. <laughs> How many of us say, I'm hanging on? Boy, that's no answer. No, Habakkuk said, brother, by faith, we're going to say whatever happens. I want you to know we're going to rejoice. This is back in the Old Testament. The prophet, this is what he says. And God tells Paul now the same thing. I want you to rejoice. Whatever you get into, I want you happy about it. Don't want you going along with your face down and saying, brother, I'm trying to hang on. It's awful rough, but I'm, I'm doing my best. God said, no, be cheerful about it. Why? Because he's going to make your feet like high. He's going to see that you don't fall. He said, the Lord God is my strength. And he'll be the same thing with all. So Paul had the victory uh, in whatever situation he was in. And that be of cheerful courage, I tell you, it carried him all the way through. And it'll carry us through. This is the word of God. God has spoken it. It'll carry us through if we can have the cheerful courage to look to God and say, God is my strength. Yes, sir. Amen, yes, sir. It's exactly what he was talking about. God was his strength. Yeah, and he's here tonight because God was his strength. Yeah. Praise the Lord forever. Yeah. Well, let's look at how, I want to go back and look a little bit how Habakkuk arrived at this. How did he get this? Well, as I said, he started off, he was a very discouraged man, bewildered. In the first chapter of Habakkuk, we can read a little bit here. He's, the burden, it says, which Habakkuk the prophet did see. He said, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling? And violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, and the wicked doth compass about the righteous, Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. He's saying, Lord, the wicked compass the righteousness, and there's violence and wickedness on every hand. God, I, I can't understand it. You ever feel that way about it? People say, why doesn't God do something? Well, that's what Habakkuk is saying. God, why don't you do something? Look at the violence on every hand. Why don't you do something about it? Well... 
The fifth verse, God said to him, Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe, though it was told to you. I'll for lo, I will raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwellings, places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed themselves. Their horses are also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from afar and they shall fly as eagles that hasteth eat. God said to him, now I want you to know Habakkuk, I am doing something about it. You can't see it. You don't know it. But I'm raising up the Chaldeans and they're going to go through this land and tear everything to pieces. And he didn't want that answer. Oh God, why don't you do something? You may not want the answer if he does. Come on now. You may not like the answer if he does. And Habakkuk didn't like the answer when he got it. God said, I am doing something. And I'm going to send the Chaldeans through this land and I'm going to tear up the houses and everything until and the thing will be on a desolate place. I'm going, to, I'm going to tear it up with the Chaldeans. He's going to, and, and I'll tell you, Habakkuk was amazed. He was absolutely amazed that God would allow it. And uh, that God would do such a thing. I wanted to read here from the New International Version. And that makes it a little bit clear uh, in that first chapter. And uh, Habakkuk in answering it, he said, O Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, will you not die? We will not die. O Lord, you have appointed them to execute judgment. Lord, you've appointed the Chaldeans to execute judgment. O rock, you have ordained them to punish. How is it that you are here, you're a holy God, and you can take these evil people to punish your children? Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up these righteous and then more righteous than them? So why do you allow these wicked to swallow up the people that are more righteous than they are? You've made them like fish in the sea. And he goes on to talk about it. But he's asking God that question. Why are you allowing these ungodly people to, to plague your people? Your children? Well, I like in the second chapter, he proceeds, Habakkuk does, and he said, I'll stand upon my, after he asked God, why can you do that? He said, I'll stand upon my watch and set my, to set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. He said, I'm going, I'm going to wait on God and I'm going to see what he's going to answer me. I'm going to wait on God. And that's where Dr. Ironside was saying the hardest thing in the world to do is to wait on God. But he said, I'm going to wait until God gives me an answer. I like the answer. Said the Lord answered me in a vision and told me what you see, you write it on tables so that whosoever readeth will run with it. And the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. And though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold, his soul is lifted up, uh, is not upright in him. And here's the answer. He said, here's the vision. I want you to know. He said, in these times when they come, the just shall live by faith. Faith in God. That's what's going to keep them. While it looks like from on every hand everything is being torn to pieces, but he said this great answer which Martin Luther picked up and John Wesley saw and others have preached and have seen down through the years, the just shall live by faith that if the fig tree fails and there's no herd in the stall and everything has gone wrong and, and the Chaldeans march over the land, I want you to know that God said to Habakkuk, the just are going to live by faith in me. What a marvelous thing. I love that song, Learning to Lean. That's a beautiful song. I'm so glad Sandy sang it. I'm learning to lean on Jesus. I'll tell you, if we can learn to lean on him, we'll find strength and sustenance when we begin to lean there. So the just shall live by faith. And then in the third chapter, Habakkuk prays a prayer. 
And he said, O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Revive us in the midst of the years and make known, in the midst of the years make known, in wrath remember mercy. He's praying now. Oh God, have mercy upon us. And in wrath, remember us, revive your work, revive your children, revive your people. Revive us, oh God. Oh, how we need revival. Is that what Brother Helm was trying to do? Oh God, revive your people, revive your children. Send us revival. We need revival. And so the answer, he's telling him uh, to revive the people, revive your children. And when he saw the just shall live by faith, in God, that's when he comes out with this wonderful thing. He saw there was the answer to all of his perplexities, all of his problems, faith in God. God would see him through. And then he comes out with this marvelous answer. If the fig tree will not blossom...